welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Hello, what Walter. Ha- what happened there, Martin? I don't know. We, we wanted to get some water behind the ears. <laughs> so. <laughs> you should be sitting under the shower. <laughs> <laughs> it's all wet under the ears. Uh, wet behind the ears. Behind the ears. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is an interesting topic that you are going to enlighten us with. Well, you see, Martin, we got so many questions. And remember, we spoke about uh, my story and how I changed from an evolutionist to a creationist. And I've always told the story that I wrote these questions on the board. Yes. And then somebody contacted me and said, he wants the questions. And I'm going, he wants the questions? That's 36 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. were the questions? I, of course, I have more or less an idea what we spoke about that created such a stir then. And, uh, and he, then he said to me, he's writing a book and he wants to incorporate the 10 questions. Can I please send them to him? Mm. So it forced me to go and sit down and think, what was it exactly that we spoke about that day? And I cannot guarantee that it's exactly the same. But it's more or less what we spoke about, mainly about the genetic aspect more than the other aspects, but they did come up. So I think it's a pretty accurate reflection of what transpired that day. Well, in any case, these 10 that you've got now is still enough to yes. debunk the whole... Well, th- I wouldn't say that we're going to create uh, you know, tidal waves. But they will hopefully make people think. Yeah, that's we that's, have to. That's what it's about, right? I think it's important because you know what? Where does it start? If cre- the creation narrative is taken away, why do you want to? Why do you want to study the rest of the Bible? The rest is obsolete. We continually say that the three angels' messages have to be proclaimed, and one of the first things in the first in the three angels messages is worship god who made exactly the so creator so this is important so let's ask the lord let's pray the lord for a word of prayer our heavenly father thank you that we can discuss this beautiful creation of yours we ask that you enlighten our minds enlighten the words and everyone watching and listening to this in jesus name amen Hello, Martin. Another thing that's constantly popping up these days is we have to follow the science. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what does the science say? You know, and all these names and all of these things come into mind when we have to follow the science. And so the churches jump on the bandwagon yeah, yeah. and say, we have to follow the science. That's sad. Even the churches. So actually, they put science above God. Because m- sometimes God, oh, most of the times, God says something and science says the other. And sometimes they say, you know, we rely on peer-reviewed journals. And the thought came to mind, how many thousands, literally thousands upon thousands of publications are there in peer-reviewed journals on evolution? So if we want to follow the science, We have to throw the Bible away if it comes to that, right? And even if it comes to other issues, how often has science proven to be exactly the opposite of reality? You see, that is the science that the Bible calls uh, calls science so-called. Falsely so-called. Falsely so-called. All right, so we're going to see if we can run through those 10 points. And uh, it might take a while. Maybe it doesn't take so long. We'll see. We'll play it by ear. So we're going to talk about creation. And I guess everybody who looks at that picture in the backdrop will realize that that's one of Henry Storber's pictures. Yeah, and this uh, it also is part of the creation movie and the adventure prof that was aired. Yes, but now it's in a WhatsApp prof, yes. right? <laughs> With a different setting. So sorry, Henry, I'm just taking your place for a while on this (laughs) side. (laughs) That's fine. We're going to talk about creation. So the Bible talks about the beginning. In the beginning. And you know, Martin, that is the crux of the whole story. 
If that story in the Bible is wrong, then what is the point of the cross? No, there is no point then. Because evolution argues that death was the means whereby we got improvement through natural selection, survival of the fittest to the detriment of the unfit. Mm -hmm. So eventually death was the process that led to all the varieties that we have today. And the Bible clearly says death is a consequence of sin. Yes. And sin can only be committed by the moral creature that comes at the end of the creation account. So, you know what? In the beginning, like you've just mentioned now, you already actually debunk it. You already debunk it. Because if there was no sin, there wouldn't have been any death. So Adam and Eve would have lived forever. Forever. So where can evolution fit in then? And what about the cross? Why would Jesus die to give eternal life <laughs> and to give life back if it wasn't so in the beginning? It, it makes no scientific sense. It makes no religious sense. And that's why theistic evolution is a misnomer. Oh, it's, it's a compromise of irrelevance because it negates the atonement completely. Completely. So it's if you d want to think of long periods of creation, you better be actually be an atheist. You there's no, well be. yeah, there's no way you can fit God into that as well. Well, so in the beginning, Martin, the Bible says the Lord created, God created the heavens, the earth, and everything that in them is. And uh, he spoke and it stood fast. Now, is that a myth? And therefore, do we have to put religion into the realm of mythology as well? Mm -hmm. That's where we will head for if that is the case. Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. This comes at the end of the fourth commandment so the fourth commandment is actually pivotal there's no other commandment that everything can hang on right so if faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen i wasn't there when it was made no i didn't see it in fact adam wasn't there when it was made he only woke up and it was there right yes so faith is the substance of things hoped for, mm. the evidence of things not seen. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. And there it is in the fourth commandment. And you are told to honor that fourth commandment, to have a relationship with God, to spend time with God, because that's what a relationship requires. Why? For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day, period. Can I in put in something here? Yes. There's nothing mentioned of a moon there. You're being naughty, Martin. But why do the people... Moon, the moon is there, but it's there on the fourth day. On the fourth day, but in this one, why six days on the seventh day rested? It didn't say there because on the... Seventh, sixth day, the moon was rising or anything like that. No, all right, but uh, let's keep that for another topic. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're hot okay. under the collar about that. But the first week is a week that God put into place and is the model for all subsequent weeks. That's it. Period. It never changed since creation. Correct. And if the Sabbath should ever have been lost, that there was a miracle in the wilderness, for six days the manna fell, exactly. and on the seventh day there was none. On the sixth day it lasted twice. By the way, that was also not subject to the moon, because then it would have been a frightening scenario. You see, that's what I mean. It's actually logical if you just read. Correct. And if it should ever have been lost... It was reiterated at the grave 
because they rested according to the commandment on the Sabbath day. And very early in the first day of the week, they went and took spices and ointments to anoint the body of Christ. And he had risen, right? Yeah. So the Julian calendar was in place then already. That was changed to the Gregorian mm -hmm. calendar because... Lo and behold, the Caesars want to have their stamp on it, right? And the current Caesar, who happened to be the Pope, he wanted to have his stamp on there, so the Jesuits moved it by 10 days, but they didn't change the cycle of the week. Like, it's been the same from creation yeah. till today. So that's pivotal. If the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is and rested on the seventh day, if he really did it in six days, then evolution is the counter-argument for this account. Exactly. So the opposer to God brought in a narrative opposing the creation week. Yeah, this is part of the great controversy. That's it. And isn't it interesting that the great controversy regarding this issue started in 1844? Because Charles Darwin wrote his first draft on the origin of species in 1844 and sent it out for comment. So everything fits into this picture of a great end-time ideological battle. Yeah. Now Martin, when I as an evolutionist was confronted with this in six days story, mm. can you imagine my thoughts? Yeah, well... I it's still the same with anybody that still has the same mindset. I thought to myself, the man who told me this, I said, thought, you ignorant peasant, what's wrong with you? Exactly. <laughs> and that's the thing. The world tells you that if you believe actually the bib biblical narrative, you're actually stupid. You're actually stupid. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a fool. Mm. And uh, I remember he brought me these books. They were all creation books. And I read them. And, of course, I was used to tearing this stuff apart with the students at the university because we had those creationists come and visit mm -hmm. and we took pleasure in ripping it apart and ridiculing what they were saying. And eventually he got so frustrated with me and he says, I don't have a problem with evolution. You have a problem. You solve it. Remember that story? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the ball was basically in my court. The Sabbath was also in there, and he also said, yeah, go, you saw that out for yourself. I also don't have a problem with the Sabbath. So how can you keep a Sabbath day in recognition of millions of years of evolution? You might as well can it, right? It's ridiculous. Exactly. Unless you work it through. Now, I'm not going to tell my story because we've told it many times, but we're going to look at what happened on that fateful day when I, for the first time, actually put some thoughts on the screen with all those professors sitting there all the postgrad students there in that think tank that evolutionary think tank discussion group class and the result was pandemonium anger such as you have never seen it's as though a bunch of hornets had come into the hall and had stung everyone it's a pity there weren't any cameras that could have recorded this. That would have been interesting because one of my colleagues literally was foaming at the mouth from anger. It was blood red and they were swearing at me. Now, that really had made a great impression on me because what had I said? I'd asked questions. Yeah. At that stage, I didn't even have the answers. Do you know what I mean? It takes time, you it takes years to study it through. But I just asked the questions and pandemonium broke loose. So I thought to myself, you know, this is deeper than we think. Mm -hmm. There's something else going on here. It's worthy of study. Exactly. Genesis chapter 6, verse 17. And behold, I, even I, to bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein there is breath of life from under the heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. Mm. Now it's interesting if you read that verse, Martin, everything that is in the earth shall die. Now he called the dry land earth. 
So everything on earth died. That doesn't mean everything in the waters died. No. So many creatures in the catastrophe did die, even in the marine world, of course. Especially if you're going to pour the marine environment over the land, you're going to have a lot of catastrophes. You're going to have a lot of death. But this verse is a total contradiction of science. Because science cannot afford a universal destruction. Mm -hmm. Because then you would have to start evolution all over again. Yeah, I understand, yeah. Okay? So if at some stage all life was there, then a universal destruction destroyed everything on land, and only that which was in a ship survived, you would have to start the evolutionary process yeah. again if you didn't believe the ship narrative, right? As a fairy tale. It's a great reset. <laughs> you should be working for the World Economic <laughs> Forum. <laughs> <laughs> so this is fascinating. So everything died. That sentence stands in absolute opposition mm. to peer-reviewed science. Absolute opposition. They will admit to local flooding, mm. local catastrophes, but never to universal catastrophes. Yeah, yeah. So we're not going to go into all the great details. If people want to study that, they can look at the whole uh, creation series that we have. We're going to look at 10 questions and highlight some interesting points. To see where we are going. Can they also read uh, that book that you wrote, Genesis Conflict? Yes, it's on, on our download, on our download server. server. They yes. can get it there. So 10 points to ponder, Martin. Let's go through 10 points to ponder. Number one. If the evolution of life started with low diversity... And diversity increased over time. Why does the fossil record show higher diversity in the past and lower diversity as time progressed? That's a, a roundabout way of saying everything seems upside down of what it should be like. Now, why would evolution of life start with low diversity? Well, obviously, Martin, if evolution is a fact mm -hmm. and somewhere by chance life evolved, then it was only in one little spot. Yes, exactly. And from that, over millions of years, diversity must have increased if the scenario even holds water. Mm. So you must expect low diversity becoming more and more and more and more. Why must it become more and more? Because we have lots of things around today. Yeah. So from one little start to many that should be reflected in the fossil record. Because that's a theory, or that is what evolution tells you is supposed to happen. The exact opposite we find in the fossil record. A massive diversity and a lower diversity today. Yeah. That is the opposite of what you would expect. Why is it so? Why is it so? And why is the diversity so much greater in the past than it is today? today. For example, one whole category of animals, mm. the mammal-like reptiles, yeah. a huge category of animals is gone. It's only in the fossil record. And that's very really interesting. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, mm. to create too much controversy. But if we take the vertebrates today, then you have the marine vertebrates, you have the fishes, you have then the first land ones halfway in between, they say, the amphibians. Then you have the reptiles, and then you have the mammals. Mm -hmm. Now, in times past, there was another category, the mammal-like reptiles. They're gone. And then, of course, in each category, there was a huge diversity that we don't have today. So it's been the whittled down, whittled down, whittled down. Yeah. So, question. Why does it show this reversed sequence? The next question we have, if evolution of necessity should progress from small creatures to large creatures over time, why does the fossil record show the reverse? Is that an interesting question? Of course. All right, now let's just explain that. 
there was a scientist and his name was Carroll. And he basically made a law, the law of Carroll, mm -hmm. which states that evolution always progresses from small to large. Uh -huh. Obviously, if you're going to have a chance development of life in some little mud pool, it's going to be a unicellular creature that's small. Yeah. You don't expect the mud pool to produce an elephant. Exactly. That's big. So you're going to go from small, little unicellular creatures, then to multicellular creatures, then to creatures with different layers and body layers, and then eventually you're going to get to where we are today. Mm. That makes, according to that logic, Sense. So originally there was one cell, then a little ball of cells. That little ball of cells developed an indentation. That indentation eventually became your gut. It became a tube through you. Then they developed a corda, a backbone, okay. and then you have the vertebrates. And this takes millions and millions of years until you have the first little creature about the size of a mini mouse. <laughs> And then maybe it had pink shoes, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then it developed bigger and bigger until eventually you get the big animals, right? Mm -hmm. So why does it why is it so that instead of seeing a sequence in the old fossil yeah. beds of only small creatures to very large creatures later, why not? Why do we see Basically, every there, everything there mm. from the beginning, yeah. and everything much bigger than it is today, and then it gets progressively smaller. Yeah, it's the reverse of what you must expect. Still, it, it's it's not evolution. You always say it's devolution. It's devolution. Now, there's a, a web page where an artist tried to capture this as realistically, according to the science. Mm as possible just to show what the size differences was and here is the web page it's boardpanda.com and he's got 37 comparisons of the sizes of prehistoric animal ancestors and their modern relatives this is an interview by roman yukitel with the artist and i've just taken some of the pictures from his web page for educational Comparison. purposes mm. just to show what science actually says about the size differences. I've only taken some, I'm not taking 37. So let's have a look at some of them. Here is a size comparison of the sloth. Now there is the prehistoric giant sloth, yeah. and that's the size of the current sloth. Yeah. Is there a size difference? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's a size difference, right? Now, obviously, when you find a fossil of a giant sloth that is this big, mm. then you say to yourself, that was a different world. Yeah. What's going on there? Now, you can take anything. You take the insect world. Dragonflies had two-foot wingspan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they come roaring here. They wouldn't fit between us, right? I don't want to know spiders. Cockro please. Cockroaches don't, were this big. Don't even tell me about a spider. Because the spiders in those thing, days would think you are a tasty morsel. <laughs> 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 All right. This friend of mine has <laughs> arachnophobia. <a> little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that was the size difference. Now, what's interesting? You would imagine that creatures like this, of this huge size sound very prehistoric. Yeah. You know, it belongs to the dinosaur age. I'm not even going to show the dinosaurs, but this is dinosaur age. And it's millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago. Mm. Do you know, Martin, that they found skins, intact skins of giant sloths in caves in South America. They were still intact. Yeah, I know. Some farmers actually put them up at their dwelling places. But how many millions of years can these things be in the past if the skins are still intact? No. It's impossible. If you even if it's frozen. Because according to their narrative, it couldn't have stayed the same for millions of years. Yeah, it always would have changed. All right, let's have a look at the wombat. This is the fossil one, the prehistoric one. 
the size that it would be compared to the present wombat. Is that evolution or devolution? Uh, it's complete devolution. Is that deterioration yeah. or progress in size? Definitely not progress in size. So it's, it's regression. It's regression. I mean... <laughs> All right. Now, if you just look at that, this is just the animal kingdom. So when the Bible speaks about giants yeah. and explains how big their beds were, then people say... Pfft. Yeah. Fairy, st fairy tale, right? And then they depict the giants as a Neanderthal. He's stupid. He's can, stupid. doesn't know. Yes. And so imagine uh, Abraham. He was almost a stature of angels still. Tell the time of Abraham. But, you know, Martin, this is fascinating. So maybe the story in the Bible is not mm -hmm. so ridiculous, right? Let's have a look at another one. Here's a lion. And... Uh, this is the prehistoric one. It's double the size of the present one. Yeah. Double the size. Now, if you saw a lion that size, uh, it would freak you out, yeah. right? Yeah. Or look at the orangutan. Yeah. There's the size of the prehistoric one. If you saw one like that, wouldn't you say it was a giant? Yes. You will. Compared to a fully grown present one. Yeah. You would say it was a giant. So not only the animal world has deteriorated, but humankind has deteriorated, right? Definitely. I just want to ask a question. Um, earlier you said you're not going to mention anything on dinosaurs. Or so I just want to know, dinosaurs, what type of um, animal did they classify as? They were reptiles. Okay, and that mammal-like uh, yep. reptiles. Okay, when you, take, when you take a skull mm. of a mammal and you compare it to the skull of a reptile, the foramen on the side, the holes on the side, to make it simple, are different. Okay. Now, the mammal-like reptiles had features of both. And today you don't have that. You only have the one and you only have the other. And they were, they were huge creatures, comparable to mm -hmm. dinosaurs, but also had features comparable probably to mammals. So they were, they were a mixture. Now, I, don't, I didn't really want to go into that, Ex but when, when the Spirit of Prophecy, for example, talks about confused species, yes, yes. Uh, then I could imagine that that was a form of amalgamation. So maybe there was technology in those days that we cannot even comprehend or are just approaching to yes. where we can actually amalgamate various creatures. We're one with seeing the other. that happen now. Correct. It's th that experimentation is ongoing in the world. But let's get back to our size differences, just a few interesting ones. Here's a modern capybara, which is a rodent creature about this size, Martin. And there is the counterpart in the fossil record. It looks like the size of a hippo. Yes. I mean, there is a huge decline in size. Or the armadillo. Look at that. I mean, it's a massive difference. And you know what? I was just thinking. Obviously, the vegetation also had to be larger. Everything was larger. The trees were larger. That's why we have these massive coal fields. That's why we have all of the resources that we have today. We call them fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So there must have been gigantic forests and huge, huge quantities of animals. You know, just now, the other day, here in South Africa, we had a massive red tide. Mm. And thousands upon thousands of tons of crayfish. Yeah washed up on the shore, thousands upon thousands of tons in a fallen world. Imagine an unfallen world. Now, if the, the oceans were not as deep then as they are now, then they would have been productive across their entire area. Mm. And much of the water that we have today was actually under the mantle, subterranean water. So all of that has changed. That means that the entire area was productive. Yeah. And there would have been a vast amount of organic material. 
an inexhaustible amount almost, which we today drive around with as fossil fuels. That's it. And that's why they get all these huge oil fields and all of this in, uh, in the bottom of the sea. Uh, exactly. But uh, that's a different topic. Mm. So these are very interesting <laughs> comparisons. Here's a modern horse compared to a, a fossil horse. Here is a modern great white shark compared to a fossil one. I mean, the, the large great white would just be a toothpick yeah. for this guy, right? A megalodon. Yes. So that tells you that something has drastically changed. Martin, is this in line with the evolutionary theory or is this in line with Scripture? 100% with Scripture. Evolution, we actually would have had bigger ones now. Yes, it would have gone the other way yeah. around. Or let's take the bison. Everybody is so impressed with the size of a bison this day. He's a toy compared to this fellow, <laughs> the prehistoric bison, or the crocodile. The size difference. This is a fully grown crocodile today, and that's what you find in the fossil record. Now, one feature about reptiles, Martin, is that they continue to grow throughout their life cycle. Mm. Mammals seem to have a cutoff point. Uh -huh. They grow to a size and then they stay there. But not reptiles. They continue growing. Sure. So if you take a dinosaur and it comes out of an egg this size, that means when it's hatched out of its egg, it's the size of a chicken. Yeah. Now that dinosaur from the size of a chicken over years will grow and it won't stop growing. So if you take these crocodiles that you had in the fossil record, why are they so large? Well, firstly, they had a perfect environment. Yes. They probably had a different diet as well. It was probably plant-based. There's a lecture on that, creation to restoration. People can have a look at that one. Perhaps you can put a link in. Put a link in it. Now, they would just continue to grow. And if they are, the situation was idyllic, then the size would have been, of course, drastically larger than and today. Mm, mm. And the dinosaur would keep on growing until it didn't fit into this room anymore. So if you had to take them into the ark, would you take a fully grown one or would you take a juvenile? Yeah, a juvenile. No problem. That's no it. problem. So that makes it also the more... Um, uh, understandable that the arc uh, narrative is true. Well, there are many web pages that talk about the arc and how many animals went into it. Uh, the web page Answers in Genesis has mm -hmm. some very good things in there. Go and have check it out and see for yourself. Well, evolution says the dinosaur has changed into a bird. How much truth is in that then? Well, that is a, a very fascinating debate. Now, it's based on some uh, fossil records where you have imprints of so-called feathers. Mm -hmm. But many of the top scientists, I mean, like the curators of the Smithsonian Institute, for example, will ridicule that and say there's absolutely no evidence that uh, birds evolved from dinosaurs mm -hmm. the entire structure is different the the tail for example of a dinosaur is a massive structure mm. which is completely gone in a bird the the bone structure is totally different because the bone structure of a bird is lightweight and has cavities in it and is superbly strong although very light, light yeah the entire physiology is different Reptiles have sac-like lungs, mm -hmm. like we have, whereas birds have through-flow lungs. And bird lung is designed to absorb oxygen on the way in and on the way out, and there's a counter-current exchange between the blood and the airflow. And that is why birds can fly at such tremendously high altitudes. Right. You'll be with a yeah. gas bottle on top of Mount Everest, huffing and puffing, and the geese will go quack, 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 quack <laughs> over the top of you. And you wonder, how do they do that? Yeah, yeah. Because of their efficient system. 
So the entire physiology is different, the entire anatomy is different, the entire structure of the foot is different, and how the one could ever have evolved out of the other is highly, highly unlikely. Okay, so, but there are questions people have. Did the dinosaurs then, how, when did they live? Well, do, uh, whether, are they actually extinct? There are mythologies mm -hmm. of humans cohabiting with dinosaurs. If you take the Ica stones, for example, there are drawings on the Ica stones from, from South America where you have humans and dinosaurs together. There are stories in the African jungles of dinosaurs. And uh, if you show some of these uh, people, the indigenous people, drawings, for example, in Africa of a bear, they don't know it. Yeah. But you show them a, story, a picture of a dinosaur, they do know it. So were they on the ark? What are all the myths of dragons? And if you read some of these myths, mm. some of them were purely historical accounts of what happened. And they described dinosaurs. Yeah. So the dinosaurs probably existed and the relics of them might still exist today in some areas. Largely, they were probably wiped out through hunting. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you take the lion, you know, if you, if you dig up the Assyrian reliefs, yeah, yeah. you find pictures of lion hunting, and people say, ah, there were no lions here because there are no lions there today. Today, I understand. Why not? Because they've become extinct through hunting. Well, if you can take um, the rhino, it was the, the black rhino in Africa was very close to extinction. Yes. So in a hundred years from today, you would have looked back at a fossil of that and probably put it a few million years back. Correct. All right, so we've looked at the first two questions, the reverse sequence, and ask ourselves, is this in line with, with creation or is this in line with evolution? Let's have a look at some other questions. Question number three. Natural selection works by eliminating the weaker variants. So how does a mechanism that works by subtraction create more diversity? That is a, a very loaded question. I understand. Because if you have two to choose from and you subject them to environmental pressure and the one is fitter, Mm -hmm. than the other one to fit into that particular environmental circumstance, then the one survives and the other one goes extinct. Mm. That's subtraction. Yeah. You started with two, you end with one. So how does a mechanism that works by subtraction mm -hmm. works through multiplication? Exactly. So you would have to duplicate this in a thousands of areas, but life just doesn't work like that. If it per chance happened to evolve over here, then you would have to postulate that it per chance happened in thousands of places so that you could still have diversity. So that's an interesting point. You're working with a mechanism of subtraction to create an increase, which is not the most logical thing to do, but we'll come back to that a little later. Another question that arises is why do the great phyla of the biome all appear simultaneously in the fossil record, in the oldest fossil records, namely in the Cambrian explosion, when they are supposed to have evolved sequentially. Mm. Now, just think about that. We are told through evolution that life evolved and then over millions of years it changed. Now, a phyla is a huge category of animals. Mm, okay. And there are only a limited number of phyla on the planet. Mm -hmm. Then subsequently you divide the phyla into subcategories. Like uh, you belong to the mammals. Mm -hmm. You're a mammalian. But you belong to the phyla chordata. Mm -hmm which doesn't only include everything that has a bony back, 
backbone like we have. A fish has a bony backbone. A reptile has okay. it. A frog has it. Mm. That's, they all fit into the core data. But it also includes many of the marine organisms mm. that don't actually have a backbone, but just like a rod, mm -hmm. a corda in the back of their, their system. So all of these creatures together, whether they are the vertebrates, which is just a subcategory of the chordates. So chordata is a massive mm -hmm. group called a phylum. Another phylum that you would have would be mollusca. Mm -hmm. The mollusks. mollusks. That includes every snail that walks on the land, every slug that r is in the sea, all the shelled organisms. Mm -hmm. They're all mollusks. It even includes the squids and the octopus. Mm -hmm. So tremendous variety within a phylum, right? Yeah. Phylum is a huge category of animals. And then you have uh, the jointed-legged animals, the, those with an exoskeleton rather than an endoskeleton. Mm. That would be the insects, that would be the crabs, that would be anything that has jointed legs, etc., so that's another huge category of animals. Now, surely, Martin, if evolution is right, and life started as a single cell and then evolved into different organisms, and eventually you had a blob of cells and then the structure yeah. developed, to develop differences like the mollusks and the chordates, or the arthropods, the jointed-legged animals, or any one of those huge categories of creatures must take millions upon millions upon millions of years. What if I told you that they were all there from the beginning? Yeah. Would that shock Good. you right out of your seat? Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly would shock you right out of your seat, right? Now, do scientists know this? We'll come to that. Okay. The answer <laughs> is yes. So this is a Big question. How is it possible, if evolution is true, that all the phyla appear already in the oldest fossil-bearing rocks? Together. Boom. They're just there. Yeah. All of them. Yeah, so there's not a... If they say, for instance, this, peer, this um, fossil is 20 million years old, but in that same period is all these other ones that might even be dated older. 20 million, you're way okay, off. Yeah, the I Cambrium is 600 million oh, minimum. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense then that everything, there has to be a transition period for Correct. It. All right, the other question is, why do we have to postulate punctuated equilibrium to explain away the lack of intermediary of fossils when gradualism is the only plausible explanation for the evolutionary fossil record? Now, let me explain that. Mm -hmm. In layman's terms. In layman's terms. Punctuated equilibrium versus gradualism. Mm. Now, gradualism is basically Darwinianism. Darwin postulated that one kind gradually evolved into another kind mm. over a long period of time. That is the only plausible way to explain evolution. Mm. Slow change through accumulated mutations over long periods of time. But in actual fact, this gradualism is not borne out by the fossil record. No. Because all of the phyla are there from the beginning. Simultaneously, yeah. Okay? Scratch your head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do you explain that? Well, you come up with a solution which is called punctuated equilibrium. Mm -hmm. That means, obviously, there must have been time of no change, equilibrium. Yeah. And then, boom, punctuated, sudden rapid change, so rapid that you can't pick up the transitions mm. in the fossil record. Okay. Why would they have to do that? Because they cannot explain why everything is there simultaneously. And why there are no transitions. Transitions, yes. Yeah, where, why you don't they have a missing link? You cannot find that one. Correct. So knowing that this is a problem in the fossil record, scientists have come up with punctuated equilibrium. Just mini, mini big bangs. 
Correct. And Stephen Jay Gould is the one who came up with the idea to explain the lack of intermediary fossils, to explain the fact that they're all there at the same time. So Martin, if they have to postulate something like punctuated mm. equilibrium, are they thereby admitting that the fossil record doesn't bear out gradualism? Definitely. They have to. All right. Now, I myself was an evolutionist. Yeah. And I was a punctuated equilibrianist. Mm. Why? Because you couldn't explain the other part. There, there was no other choice. <laughs> if I wanted to remain an evolutionist, I had to become a punctuated equilibrianist. Okay, so do punctuated equilibrianist. <laughs> Just say that again, that was fun. <laughs> Don't cut that out, please. <laughs> punctuated equilibrianists. <laughs> I think I got it. You got it. Okay. Do they then believe that humans were also created like that, punctuated? Or Suddenly they were there. There, but the, the intermediaries, they're not there. Because they can't find the missing link. Correct. It's not there. So this is the whole point, Martin. Now, I have another question for you. Punctuated equilibrium is there because everything is in the fossil record already. What is the innate difference between punctuated equilibrianism and creation? They don't, there is no. The only thing that's different is the one has a God and the other one doesn't. I just wanted to say, there's a creator in the one and the other one is just by chance. Correct. So, wanting to deny the creator, <laughs> I had to be a punctuated <laughs> equilibrianist. It's actually an oxymoron because yeah. you just have, the, you have to have the same faith. Aha. So, punctuated equilibrium has faith in rapid evolution. Yeah. So rapid that everything is there at the same time. Exactly. God created everything. Martin, <laughs> there is no room for a divine foot in the door. You understand the problem? Okay. So, we are in the business of expounding the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages, the first angel's message is about worship. Mm -hmm. Worship him who made. Is this a system of worship? Definitely. Oh, yes. So what are you worshipping? You are worshipping here the inherent power of nature to produce a miracle. Everything is there at the same time. So you've replaced your God. You've replaced God the Creator with Mother God. Earth. You have replaced her with Mother Earth or Mother Nature. So, Mother. actual fact, if you are a punctuated equilibrianist, you are a Gaia worshipper. You that just don't exactly. want to give it that name. And that is the more logic of the evolution beliefs to have because you can't explain gradualism. Correct, because it's not borne out in the fossil record. And Darwin himself mm, admitted admitted that this is a flaw in his theory. And in order to circumvent the flaw, you have punctuated equilibrium. Now, that's the way it is. Let's go to some other questions. If natural selection works at the level of the phenotype and not the level of the genotype, then how did genes, mitosis, meiosis, with their intricate and highly accurate mechanisms of gene transfer evolve? It would have to be by random chance. Now that's a mouthful. So I have to unpack it. Yes, we'll unpack please. it with pictures just now, but let's just talk about it. That was definitely one of the questions that I put on the board. Because evolution of necessity has to work with what is physically present. Mm. Uh, survival of the fittest. The two that you are comparing, the one that's going to be not so fit and the one that is fit, have to be physically there. Exactly. The one can't be missing. Right. So if they are physically there, the obvious question is how did they get there? 
Are you with me? Yes. We'll unpack it just yeah. now a little bit more. So the phenotype mm -hmm. is what is physically there. That's what you can see. So Martin, if I had to explain your phenotype, I would now give a description of what you look like. But because I'm naughty, I'm not going <laughs> to do that. <laughs> because it would have something to do with my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Now, if you had to give one about me, then you could also, you know, we'll nitpick. We'll leave it, leave it at this. All right. But the fact of the matter is I'm taller than you. Yeah. All right. But now because I'm older, I probably can't run as fast as <laughs> you can. But in the old days, when I was younger, if I were the same age, I would probably be able to run faster than you because I've got longer legs, right? That's it. So in an escape situation in the African bush, I would probably outrun you, right? Yes, so I would be... You would be the meal. Yes. I would have been the survival of the fittest. You will be the fittest, and I would have not okay. made it. What determines your phenotype? Your genes. Aha! Mm. Your genes determine your phenotype. But the genes are like information yeah. that is transferred into your phenotype. But evolution can do nothing with your genotype. Mm. It can only test the, what's there? the ability of what's actually the result there of you. Yeah. Can you run faster than me? That is the question, that, right? That, but that you can also just see according to the phenotype. All right. So when it comes to the selective pressure, whatever it is, let's call it climate change is the selective pressure pressure it's mm. now becoming warmer yes all right and the one creature is overheating because it has a heavy fur and the other one has a shorter fur that's a phenotypic difference mm. the one that is more likely to uh, survive the heat wave is the one that has the shorter fur and can get rid of the heat easier mm. right mm -hmm. okay so that's a way to deal with it that's the phenotype the genes, how did they come into existence? Natural selection cannot work with letters and numbers because they're not producing anything yeah. yet. The letters and the numbers had to come about by chance. Yeah. So, bottom line is, natural selection only works at the level of the phenotype, not the level of the genotype. Then how did the genotype... Mm -hmm which can only be tested as to its adequacy once it has produced a phenotype. How did they come about? Or what about the processes to transfer the genes to the next generation mm. or to multiply the cells, which is mitosis? Or the process to take it to the next generation, which is meiosis, with all their highly intricate mechanisms of gene transfer how did they come into existence like you said by chance by chance so it would have to be by random chance something just happened to work and produced a viable phenotype one gene can never do it to get you into a viable phenotype takes millions and millions of genes exactly all right so we're moving heavily into the realm of faith and when it comes to this. Exactly, that's what I just wanted to say. This is, you have to, this, it's a religion. You have to have faith to believe that it's by chance. Correct. Now, number seven, the process of crossing over mm. during meiosis. That's when genes actually transfer information. Mm -hmm. But that information must first produce uh, offspring before it can be tested. Natural selection only comes into play when the thing is actually there. Yeah, yeah. We're now playing with numbers here. So how did that highly sophisticated mechanism that requires such absolute precision, how did it come about? So how could natural selection bring this about if it is only operative at the level of the phenotype? The answer is by chance. Yeah. Now it's becoming a faith. And that's why I said by faith. Now, when I got to this point in the discussion, one of those students got up and said, so you're telling me 
that this is actually a religion and that I was duped into giving up my religion and this created mm. the outburst of anger. Did, did, just a side note, did you, do you know if that uh, student ever got back to faith? That student who was actually, without me knowing, because I never even knew they existed, an Adventist. Wow. And years later, I received a message that this person had heard that I, who was a lecturer, had changed my opinion on evolution and she couldn't believe it. Uh, I think she's actually married to a pastor. Oh, wow. That's so I oh. could apologize to her for my rudeness. Wow. In class. I think there was people that, uh, in, from your testimony, that actually would appreciate this answer. So, yes. Wow. So the next question I also have is how can we explain the evolution of two sexes with compatible anatomical differences? when only the result of the union, increased diversity in the offspring, is subject to selection but not the cause. Mm -hmm. Let me run that by you, Martin. In order to have natural selection, to have something to work with, mm. there must be variety. Yes. Now, we've seen that natural selection actually reduces the variety. <laughs> yes. So it's a mechanism that makes less and less. So how are we going to feed its hunger for variety? Are you with me? That's it. So, so evolutionists ha have an explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay. They say the fact that there is gene transfer between a male and a female mm. produces massive variety. Mm. And that variety must then be put into actual phenotypes, little different offsprings. Yeah. So if you have children, they don't all look exactly the same. There's variety because there is this exchange of genetic material. But it doesn't explain where the two sexes come from to produce the variety exactly. in the first place. Neither does it explain the absolute intricacy of the mechanism that is required to produce the offspring in the two sexes. Those two can produce something. That Correct. Neither does it explain why there is such an anatomical difference between a male and a female in order to achieve this in the first, first place. place. Mm. Neither does it explain how these various cells come together to produce a variety in the offspring by the union of a male and a female germ cell, which now has to mingle its genetic information, mm. then still chop it up and change it over for the next generation, and then produce a phenotype that eventually will be subject to natural selection. It all had to come about by, by chance. Chance, exactly. It's impossible to explain this in any other way. All right. And God said he created them male and female. Period. That's it. Now, what created the male and female in the evolutionary scenario? Chance. Aha. Uh -huh. Is that a faith? Yeah, of course. It has to be because you cannot prove it. It's a religion. Yeah, it's a religion. But it is the only thing that actually explains where the variety comes from that you need to feed this hungry beast called natural yeah. selection. Isn't it sad that this is the narrative that the whole world ha is being taught? All right. Now, if you look at that yeah. and you realize that God created the male and female, I don't want to go there, mm. but what does it do to woke thinking? Exactly. There, you can think what you are. Exactly. But let's not go there. It's not part of this discussion. No. So, Martin, there are other problems with the evolutionary scenario. Number one, you have to postulate where matter came from. Because you are a physical being. Right? Yeah. Didn't and I we just take it for granted that everything is there. Yeah, but didn't I come from a big bang? Well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> so you have to postulate mm. the origin of matter. Where did it come from? Mm. It doesn't just stay with the evolution of one animal kind to another kind. It transcends all the sciences. Yeah. Now, how many peer review 
articles must there be in the world to cover all of those aspects? Millions. And they're all postulations. So we're looking for dark matter mm -hmm. because we have to postulate that it's there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't find it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so origin of matter, where did it come from? Origin of the genetic code. These have to be massive chance occurrences that just happen to provide everything that you need. This provides the matter for everything uh, that is used in physical life. This provides the, the genetic variability. The, the, the code of the genetic... Uh, the genetic code puts the matter together to get something that actually Correct. exists. And then you also have to explain something which scientists are calling irreducible complexity. Mm. Irreducible complexity means that whichever you're talking about couldn't have evolved over time. Because the thing is so complex and only works if everything is put together. At the same time. And everything has to be there in order for it to operate. We'll look at an example yeah. just now. So it's irreducibly complex. You take one component out, like if I take my watch and I rip out one of the wheels and I throw it away, my watch doesn't work because it needs that piece. But it also needs all the other pieces that are in the watch. And if I take any one of them out, my watch is not going to yeah. work. It is irreducibly complex. Whatever's in there has to be. needs to be in there. So some of the irreducibly complex things, how did they evolve? Because I cannot create my watch incrementally. I cannot throw a cog down there and then another one and another one until I've thrown all the parts required for my watch onto the table. <laughs> How's it going to get together <laughs> if there's no designer? Yeah. Right? It's exactly they all loose and everywhere. You cannot get but it. But the problem is, Martin, we cannot afford a designer. Mm -hmm. So you have to get think up something for this. The designer has to go. <laughs> There's no room for a divine foot in the door. That's what they say. Yeah. And they are evolutionists. They believe in irreducible complexity without believing in a designer. Their designer has to be called chance. Chance. So their faith, their God is chance. It's a religion. Not to speak about the universal flood about which the Bible speaks about. We have to look at some of these issues. So this is just the introduction, Martin. That's good. I'm sure people will be hungry to see what's coming next. So basically, Martin, what we're saying is that in any one of these issues, if you want to remove God out of the equation then you are moving into the realm of faith. That's it. Right? There's no other way. There's no other way. And then you have a faith-based religion, which is called science. Mm. And it is in opposition to what the Word says. It has to be, because it cannot survive. So if it wants to marry what the Word says with itself mm. and call itself theistic evolution then you have a mingling of truth and error. supposition, which would be error. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the origin of matter, mm. and then we'll continue our discussion in another episode. Yes, because... So we can get the whole picture. Exactly, that we can fit this puzzle together. Okay, let's look at the origin of matter. What does the Bible say? Where does matter come from? He spoke and it stood fast. Yeah, so the right? voice of God. By the word, mm. by the word of the Lord were the heavens and the earth created. So he spoke and it stood fast. And it's by that word that you live, not by bread alone. Correct. Now who came up with the idea of a big bang? It was the Jesuits, Martin. Mm. The Jesuits. The Jesuits who called the Bible particularly this version, yeah. which is the King James Version, they called it that poisonous asp, yeah. that they want to grab it by the tail yeah. like the serpent of Moses and get rid of it. Well, they haven't gotten rid of it yet. No. 
but they're trying very hard at the level of learning against learning, mm -hmm. which is universities. Now let's see how brilliant scientists come up with an answer to this. Well, here is a physicist, and his name is Lawrence Krauss. He's a quantum physicist. Mm, okay. Now, quantum physics is actually very interesting because it mingles mysticism mm. with reality. Okay, so it's actually a religion and science mixed. Yes, because it doesn't have any other choice. Yeah. Because there are things that are so inexplicable that they require a mystical answer. And so they gave themselves a name that sounds very clever. Yes. So let's look at an article which he posted in 2010 already, and which is the basis of the origin of everything. How to get something, namely the universe, out of nothing. It sounds uh, familiar. Yes. Uh, God created everything out of nothing. Quantum physics comes with exactly the same solution. So when we march backwards along the arrow of time, we reach the point from which everything began, the point that modern science calls the Big Bang. Mm. Jesuits coined that phrase. Scientists have a wonderful grasp it really sounds very <laughs> scientific. And I'm sure there are thousands of peer-reviewed papers to substantiate what he is saying. Scientists have a wonderful grasp on what happened a billionth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. This, of course, only begs the question, what came before the Big Bang? But we know, we have a wonderful grasp of what happened a billionth of a billionth of a second after the Big yeah. Bang. But before that, we have to have faith. Let's see what he says. <laughs> Physicist Lawrence Krauss demonstrates that the answer is nothing. And that under our current understanding of physics and contrary to traditional logic, it is not just probable that we get something out of nothing, it is absolutely inevitable. This is the standing of modern science. Everything was created from nothing. And we have a wonderful understanding of what happened a billionth of a, billionth of a second when nothing exploded, namely everything. Everything that you see today, we study it yeah. and we explain it and we use the evolutionary theory like we discussed it here. And we know what it looks like now, but what did it exist, consist of before that? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. May I ask you, as someone not in this field, you were educated in books and auditing and uh, bookkeeping and things like that. If you had to do some bookkeeping of what happened a billionth of a billionth of a second after nothing exploded, what would you conclude would be there when nothing exploded? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> right? Exactly. But in actual fact, we've got everything. Yeah. So your bookkeeping only starts once everything has exploded. This won't balance. Right, so nothing exploded yeah. and created everything. Is that faith? Of course. How much faith do you need to believe that it's absolutely inevitable that nothing exploded and created everything? You have to have 100% faith in it. All right. What does it exclude? God. God. Yeah. We come back to that point every single time. So Martin, if we look at the universe... And we look at the vast dust clouds. They all came from nothing. Mm. And these vast clouds of nothing expanded into everything. And if you had an explosion, everything would go out centrally from a central point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. And so they say the universe is expanding exactly. because it exploded. Yeah. Then at some stage, it will come back upon itself because of what they call gravity. And it will implode. Correct. 
Now here I have a major problem. The forces of gravity will never ever be able to gather everything back again upon itself, let alone let it collapse. Yeah. And so how do you get things like stars? And in the, if nothing exploded, well then basically you had nothing. But in actual fact, they don't actually have nothing. They have protons, mm. which is the smallest particle in the hydrogen atom, right? Yeah. They had protons. They don't say where the protons come mm -hmm. from. If you break them up, they consist of quarks. Yeah. And there are three quarks. Now, they can only exist in threes. If you remove one, then the other two will suddenly have another one. Yeah. Where did that come from? <laughs> Out of nothing. And I the one that was one would cr have another two attached to it. Because it can never exist as one. It has to exist as three. So everything has to suddenly come into existence out of nothing because it is required to be something. It, it, uh, well, that makes me think of something else. This, that they can, only be, they can only be three the whole time. Yes, but uh, <laughs> don't, don't go there, Martin. <laughs> You're going to create controversy. You're a very controversial <laughs> fellow, you know that? <laughs> but the whole idea that everything then coalesced into stars, they realize that you cannot get them to coalesce into stars. Because if I pop a balloon yeah. and the gas dissipates, what is the probability that I can get the gas back into the balloon? Zero. Right, but they have to postulate yeah. that. Not only that, it has to collapse upon itself and create a star. Then they have to have nuclear fusion within the star so that out of just gas and protons, they can push them all together and make all the other atoms that are needed to make life. But then they have to get into the environment. So that star will have to explode in a supernova mm -hmm. to create all the other material that is ne necessary for life. And once enough of that has accumulated and that coalesces, then eventually you get planet Earth. And then you have the right conditions and you can get life to evolve on planet Earth because you have to explain from nothing exploding and creating everything how you get from nothing to you. Yeah. <sighs> Is it a religion? No, oh, I think it's a I think it's a hard religion. But it's a religion. Yeah. So this is the theory of the Big Bang. Well opposed to that, now you just have the matter. Yeah. You still have to transform the matter which came from nothing, mm -hmm. into something. And then you have to start the evolutionary process so that you can create the philosopher who thinks about how nothing exploded and created everything. And the whole world is full of philosophers. Exactly. And, the and they call it science. That's it. And the whole world is being taught this. I think if I remember correctly, it was a comment or somebody that mentioned there was a Big Bang, but it was when God spoke. You are right. God <laughs> spoke and there was a big bang and everything was there. It was f formless and void. Yeah. And then God ordered it. Yeah. Just the fact that God ordered it is contrary to the laws of thermodynamics because thermodynamics says that everything deteriorates from a system of order to disorder. Mm -hmm. That is a constant law. And evolution has to violate that law. So within that law, they create pockets of order in order to circumvent yeah. the law. Martin, this is a very deep subject. I can and see we can that. carry on discussing this forever mm. and ever. I think we should take a short break here and then come back and just look at the other side of the story. What do you say? I think that will be awesome. I think there's a lot that people can go and do some self-study on yes. after this yes. episode. And we'll continue it again in the next one. Let's continue will in the next one. Us, Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are faced with different religious systems in the world. And science, particularly certain aspects of science, qualifies religion. And we have to choose this day whom we will serve. Help us to make right choices by not just looking at science, 
but looking at all the other evidence as well. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.